And the same applies to the spouse. You know you love them, but you need to say it again and again. Like we got to the food moments ago, and you need to say this food is, mashallah, it's really, really great. Even if the salt is a little bit more. Because sometimes, as I was saying, she spends so much time bringing it in front of us, and we are worried about how it's smelling, number one. And number two is we say, as we taste it, the salt is too much, no? Salt is too much, no? What are you talking about? She just looks at you and her face flops. I've been at it for three hours here, four hours. I've been busy with this for so many months. And what is she going to say? Next time I'll try a bit better, a bit harder. That's if she's a good woman. If not, she'll say, never going to cook this again. <laughs> typical. Never gonna, it's typical. Never going to cook this again. And if you have someone who's very witty, the next time there's salt to be put in, I'll call you to put it. So we need to praise the cooking of our wives, we need to praise their, 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 their dress code, especially, for example, I can let you know something that has worked for some people. Where you find some women, you know, they don't like to dress appropriately, so the husband sometimes wants to tell them something, there are two, three ways of doing it. You can either say, this is very bad, I don't want you to wear this, and you know, you might have a response, but if you want a response from the heart, what you do is, you tell them, the other dress looked much better than this. You see, so you are praising one thing and that praise is not there when the other thing is there. So you have told them in a way that this is what I really love. And go beyond the limits in praise. That's your wife, don't worry. You can say whatever you want to. Mashallah, in terms of goodness. Like the food, you, when you eat, even if it is a little bit this way, that way, just praise it, mashallah, see what it is. Praise the effort at least, mashallah, you know. Let me tell you what has happened once. They say the imam in the masjid said, in fact, two things have come to my mind. The imam in the masjid said, you need to praise the cooking of your wife, just like I said now. So the man went home and he had this meal and he was looking at it and looking at his wife and smiling and all happy, mashallah, and excited and everything. And when he finished, he says, oh, it was awesome. And the wife says, what? I've been cooking for you for 21 years. You never said that. Today when the food came from the neighbor, you want to say it was awesome. So he says, oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. <laughs> it's like the other one. The Imam, he, he was telling the people, you know, he gave them advice in the masjid about their wives that look, you need to do this and do that. So the man goes home very happy. He tells his wife, darling, I'd like to carry you today. Oh, wow. Oh, I hope I'm not too heavy, darling. You know? So anyway, he carries his wife, mashallah, and he's carrying. What makes you do this, my beloved? What's happening here? Oh, the imam told us, go home and carry your burdens, mashallah. <laughs> you carry my burden, mashallah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Today, when you miss someone, whom you are not even supposed to be connected to, start crying. We have a friend on Facebook, for example, and for three days she did not send us a message. We start crying. I wonder what's going on. Wallahi, have you seen her? No. Do you know her? Well, from Facebook. Is that exactly what she looks like? I hope so. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it might be a man pretending to be a woman. Ask some of the young boys around, they'll tell you we've got 10 profiles on Facebook. Eight of them are as girls and two of them are as boys. Some people do this and they get a kick out of it. And yet we are on the other end, click, 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 crying. Why? Because you, just, you don't want to talk to me anymore. We shed tears for someone of that nature. Have you shed tears for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have you thought about your maker? You are going to return to him. Have you ever cried? Have you ever listened to his message and tear? Allahu Akbar. You go to a place like the Haram in Mecca. May Allah grant us return to that place many times. And you stand, your hairs raised. You think of Allah and you busy crying. Those tears are valuable. We call them the warm tears that roll down your cheeks. The tears of turning to Allah. When you repent to Allah, you ask Him for forgiveness. Truly, you end up crying. Tears come in your eyes. Ya Allah, forgive me, I am weak. Those tears are included in these. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. I would like to end by saying, my brothers and sisters, every one of us will be looked at on the day of judgment. And the main highlight will be the presentation that you have put forth. 
Look at it. Think about it. What have you chosen as the highlight of your life? For indeed, it is now the time to prepare the parcel, to prepare the gift, your own little gift that you will be presenting. Ya Allah, I got this. And this is what I'm going to put forth. Allah knows it. Brothers and sisters, prepare today for tomorrow. That day, it's going to be too late. No matter where we are standing and what we have on that particular day, it is now that we will be preparing for it. So here we are sitting in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reminding one another to do good deeds, speaking about the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that particular day. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant it to us. And until we meet again, I'd like to say, we want to see one another in paradise. May Allah unite us in paradise, my brothers and sisters. May we love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I tell you, for the love of Allah and for the sake of Allah, I too would declare my love for you, my brothers and sisters. What joins me with you? What brings us together? Can I tell you? Nothing besides the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sake of Allah. You don't know me, nor do I perhaps know you on a personal note. Perhaps I know very few of you, very few of you, perhaps a handful. But the rest of us, we are part of one family. Don't forget that. We will get together on the day of judgment. Ya Allah, we love one another for the sake of Allah. And we heard that you said that if that is the case, we now qualify for VIP status here. Allahu Akbar. So Ya Allah, grant it to us. My brothers and sisters, I have weaknesses and so do you. Some people's weaknesses are apparent and some of them are hidden. May Allah make me non-judgmental and may He make me from amongst those who can help myself and help others to improve. And may He be from amongst those whom when He judges us, He judges us with mercy and leniency until that day. And until the day we meet again, inshallah, by the will of Allah, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad, subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu. Do you know that when we have to choose a spouse, and I'm getting to that now, when we have to choose a spouse, you know, there's people smiling at me here, and I know why. They say, why weren't you here 20 years ago? Okay, it's fine. <laughs> If you've already done it, it's okay, we can rectify. But we have to talk to those. We have to talk to those who have not yet uh, chosen the spouse. And even if you have, try and go back and see the qualities that you have looked at and develop on them, develop them. When you choose a spouse, the hadith says there are several things that people look at. Al-mal, some people look at wealth. Al-jamal, some people look at beauty. Al-hasab, some people look at the status of the person. And some people look at the nasab, which is the lineage of the person. And some people look at the deen and the religion of the person. So many people don't understand this narration. When the narration says, The hadith says, Become successful by selecting the one with religion, with character and conduct coupled with deen. One narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُوقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ when a proposal comes from someone whom you are satisfied with their level of character and conduct, or in fact, starting with the level of deen and character, then allow them to get married. Allow them to marry. You're looking at two things, character and deen, which means if the character is great and good or equivalent to yours slightly higher, and the deen level is equivalent to yours slightly higher, then you stand a better chance for your daughter to be in a home where she will be happy. Get them married. So why is it that when it comes to wealth and looks and so on, some people think that in Islam, you don't look at looks. You know, you don't look at looks as it is. The women are supposed to be covered. You don't look at looks. That's wrong. The hadith didn't say do not look at looks. The hadith is saying you see all the points you want to see, but give the tip of the scale to the deen. Which means if you have someone who's drop dead gorgeous and they don't have any deen in them and then you have someone who hasn't yet, you know, killed you. You know what drop dead means you die. <laughs> they haven't yet killed you with their looks, but mashallah they can, I don't know if you can say drop unconscious gorgeous. <laughs> if that's a statement which is slightly lesser than the DD, you know. So if someone comes and they are good looking, okay, they have a better deen in them. It is better for you to compromise the looks to a certain extent 
and make sure that the religion is intact than to go only for looks because the plan of Allah is there will come a stage when that blemishless face will develop wrinkles. If you have loved the outward face, you will not be able to get along with that woman. Do whatever is in your capacity, then surrender to the decree of Allah. Whatever is in your capacity. You've built a house, awesome, mashallah. You put the best roof there, mashallah. When the rains came, the roof fell down. Not your fault. You put the best. That was in the hands of Allah. Surrender to the decree. Be happy. We have rains right now as I'm speaking in Zimbabwe. We have rains quite heavy. And there's one portion that leaks a little bit. And when I see it, wallahi, I won't lie to you. I actually smile to myself and I get happy. Yeah, Allah, you gave us a leaking roof, mashallah. You know, get upset and do what? Get embarrassed and do what? Take your time, repair it at your earliest convenience. Smile at your family. Enjoy the water in the bucket. Splash it at one another and make a romantic scene out of it. It's possible, but we become the same thing. We become depressed. It's leaking. I told you, you got to repair that. I, the last season as well. You waited for that. For what? Just peek and start flicking. Mashallah. See how it changes. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> That's the decree of Allah. What could I do? We put in. We put in everything properly. This is what we mean when we say you can convert something that appears to be so negative into positivity just by surrendering to the decree of Allah and looking at the positives. We tend to be very negative people sometimes. You know, people say, this guy worships his wife. Have you ever heard that statement? This guy worships his wife. I see a lot of brothers saying yes, you know. Uh, that is not, the meaning of it is not worship as in rendering an act of worship for. No, all it means is he obeys his wife's instructions. That's what it means. And I can give you on a lighter note, and I really like this because it plugs in. We are all human beings and we like a little bit of, you know, humor sometimes. They say there was a king. And he called all his subjects, the males, and he says, anyone who is ruled by his wife, come in this line. And whoever rules his wife, where, you know, the instructions are not obeyed, so to speak, or they come from you as a man, then you stand in this line. So the whole community stood in the wrong line. Allahu Akbar. They all stood in a line saying, no, if my wife sees me in the other line, I'm dead meat. You see? So what happened is, they all got one egg each, an egg. They were given one egg. And there was one man who stood in the line. I am the man. You know, in the house, I am the man. So the king was so happy, at least amongst my subjects, there is one man who has such greatness, you know, meaning he has the quality, Rujula, you know, he's a man, you know. So now the king gave him a horse, brown horse. And the, in fact, the king told him, choose from the horses you want. So he chose the brown one and left the black one. And he rode home galloping away. Everyone else went home with one egg. So when he got home, his wife, he looked at her and says, Do you know what? She says, what? Today I got a horse because I'm the boss. You see? I got a horse because I'm the boss. She says, okay, that's good. Excellent. So you're the boss. So he says, you know, I was told to choose from three horses. There was a white one, a black one, and this brown one that I've actually come with. This was the best one. She says, wow, you look great in it. You look great in this horse, but you'd look greater in the black one. He says, well, not a problem. I had a choice. I can go back and get the black one. So he goes back galloping to the castle. And he says, oh, king. The king says, yes, what's happening? He says, I just want to swap my horse. He says, why? When I went home, my wife told me that you'd look better in the black horse. The king says, no problem. He took the horse and gave him one egg. Allahu Akbar. So the moral of the story is obedience. We're talking of obedience. People say you worship someone when you obey them. You know, people say this man worships his wife because he obeys. Wallahi, we don't even understand that the example of Allah is higher. We can never ever equate Allah with any human being. But we need to know that ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also connected to obeying his instructions. And Allah will not tell you to do something that is detrimental for you. He won't. Whatever Allah has instructed you to do, and whatever He has asked you to abstain from, all of that is for your benefit, O oh man. Why is it that we want to look at it and think that this is very difficult? When? If someone were to tell us to do something that is not beneficial for us, because we love them, we might end up doing it. Why is it that we don't show higher love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. So where does it fit in with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's example? He, as we all know, was the highest of all the messengers. He was the highest in rank. And he is the Nabi who was sent to us and the final one. So he has so many different points of being better than the others. Yet he was very, very humble. So humble that when people spoke to him in a bad way, you know how he reacted? We're going to his example because we need to learn because the topic here is about the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the goodness that lies in it for us to follow. Imagine he knew who he was. He knew who he was. And when people maltreated him and spoke ill about him and tried to harm him and in fact inflicted some bodily harm on him, what was his reaction? Before I get to it, think about what your reaction would be. If you knew you are the CEO or a president or a top leader in the world or a very, very rich man and someone insulted you, how would you feel? Perhaps that person would be jailed to say the least. If not, eradicated. Allah, Allah forgive us for even thinking in that direction. But we would want to vent it. If some young boy tells you, uncle, you say, yes, you are stupid. <laughs> Did you think I was going to say that? <laughs> Did you think I was going to say that in this talk? No. Well, I didn't think so either. <laughs> but how would we react? Say, hey, who are you? Where's your father? That's still a good reaction. Someone like me, one smack. <laughs> say, uncle, no, you are very clever. <laughs> uncle, you are sharp, mashallah. Why? Because he knows now I've got one. So we, we would like to react in a specific way. Because our mind is tuned in that direction. You know, when I last spoke about minds being tuned in a specific direction, you see the television, what it does to us. People love movies. If I ask you, uh, name me some movies. In this hall, I'm sure we get about a thousand movies named Allah protect us. What does a movie do to you? SubhanAllah, it trains your mind to react in a specific way. Do you know that? It trains your mind to look at life in a specific way. It trains your mind what is good and what is bad. It trains, it actually comes and makes you or breaks you. That's what movies do. Especially when you are hooked onto them. You know one day, true story. When I was in high school and I went to a college, St. John's College in Zimbabwe in Harare. It's a very good school, one of the top schools there. And they have what is called civis day. We call it civis day, we're plain clothes day. You don't need to wear your uniform on this day. So I went just like how I am right now. That's how, this is how I went to school. And I was still in high school. And I was the only one dressed like this. And uh, everyone else was dressed in their own things. So we had an English teacher. I don't know where she is right now, but she was a very, very good English teacher. She looked at us, she looked at me and she says, stand up. I thought, oh no, okay, let's stand up. So I stood up. So she says, I can tell you something about you. I said, what? She says, you don't have a television at home. I said, yes. <laughs> it's a true story. I'm telling you a fact. An elderly lady telling me, I know that you don't have a television at home. I was so impressed. I was so intrigued. I wanted to know, how do you know, ma'am? <laughs> so I asked her, how do you know? Do you know what she told me? Wallahi, what I'm about to say woke me up 20 years later, not at that time. She told me, you are original, that's why. <laughs> the rest of them, they're just wearing what they saw others wearing, and it's, they carry on that way. Everyone has their own things. You know now, you have an earring, you have a big chain here, and you know how they walk. <laughs> Where did they get that from? They got it from the television, subhanAllah. The Quran did not say, the television is Uswa Hasana. They say a husband hit his wife. Now, you know, nowadays, even if you don't, you look at her and she sues you. You know? <laughs> Why? Because he threw his eyes. Oh. <laughs> the judge says, Why did you beat up your wife? So he looks at the judge. He says, Judge. The judge says, you cannot. It's impossible. Why did you lift a finger? Do you know? And to be honest, before we go ahead, believe me, don't think that a husband has a green light to beat up his wife in Islam. Don't think that. Do not think that. May Allah protect us. 
You don't just engage in violence and make, create hooliganism out of Muslims. No. We should be the best to our spouses. If the hadith says, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi. Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the best from amongst you are those who are best to their spouses or their family members. I challenge you to live up to that. May Allah protect us. So this man says, Judge, you know my wife came in front of me with a big purse, this size. And she looked at me and smiled. And she opens the big purse and from, the, from inside it, she took out another purse and then she put the big one down and then she opened the other one and she smiled at me and she took out another one from inside that one and then she put the bigger one down and then she opened the other one and she took out another one from inside that one and then put the other one down and then she opened that one and took out another one and left the one down and then opened that one and took out another one and then put the other one down. And then she had this little one which she opened and took out another one. And she put, so the judge says, get to the point, get to the point. He says, judge, judge, you are getting so angry when I'm telling you the story. Imagine I was right there. This is what I mean when I say we sometimes open purses in front of our brothers and sisters, intentionally irritating them. And when the story goes out, it irritates others as well. Look at this man. He's irritated solely by hearing what has happened. Imagine if we were there. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. So the moral of what I'm saying is do not intentionally create irritation that will result in hatred, which will result in violence, which will result in so much damage to the Muslim Ummah and tears that can be avoided and yet they are there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness.